Hi, everyone. Uh, hopefully, um, it's been a smooth transition and everyone can see my screen and hear me okay. Um, well, thanks so much again for having me and I um, you know, really appreciate um, the AIM team for putting this together for our skin cancer patients. Obviously, we are very passionate uh, about these uh, conditions um, and uh, unfortunately, there is a lot of skin cancer, as Dr. Mustafar mentioned, uh, you know, sort of in the sun belt. Um, so so um, my part of this talk, will talk about a basal cell carcinoma. Um, this picture is actually a real basal cell carcinoma, obviously it doesn't look like this to naked eye. Um, but when we look at it through this uh, device called the dermatoscope, um, you can see all the blood vessels that the tumor is sort of summoning to the skin um, to, you know, help get the nutrients to grow. Um, often, you know, there's some erosions like this in the in the tumor, so it, it can often be kind of bleeding, um, and there's a lot of scarring that it causes. So basal cell skin cancer being the most common type of skin cancer, you know, not quite quite as um issue, not quite as uh, aggressive as some of the others but just certainly a big nuisance with with its uh, blood vessels and bleeding and pain and things of that nature so most common diagnosed malignancy in the US I would actually as far as um go as far as saying you know several other countries I mean South Africa Australia it is just out of all the skin cancers tends to be the most common. Um, we estimate about 5.4 million cases. Um, and also not just, you know, only in Caucasian skin, but, you know, several um, sort of, we call them like Fitzpatrick three and four sort of medium skin tones can get this as well, as well as darker skin types. Um, so it's something that, you know, sometimes I feel it's not a if you're super fair skinned and, you know, spend some time as a child in the sun, it's not a matter of, you know, if you would get this, it's a matter of when. Um, and we believe a lot of the sun damage happens before the age of 18. Um, so for a lot of us, I wouldn't say the ship has sailed, but a lot of the mutations that lead to these skin cancers happen early on. So we we definitely need to be careful about all the things we talked about, you know, tanning beds and things not to add to that sun damage. Um, but it, I think it's important to understand what this means and how to how to take care of yourself or your loved ones if you did get one of these tumors. Um, and so even though it's a super common tumor, as you can see, it's a super rare disease to get uh, metastatic, uh, which means spreading to other organs and causing havoc. Uh, it does happen. Uh, unfortunately, we do see this at Duke being a referral center. And so we'll talk a little bit about that in this talk, but majority of the cases, fortunately, fortunately are early. So, um, um, Dr. Muzaffar mentioned a little bit about the squamous cell skin cancer that's kind of listed out here. This is just a sort of a three-dimensional schema of the skin. So squamous cell skin cancers kind of start at the surface, um, you know, I would say sort of these spiny looking cells in the middle. Um, and so they go through like this pre-malignant to malignant sort of transition. Basal cell skin cancers start sort of at the base. They're the cells sort of at the bottom of the first layer of the skin. And so when they start to become a tumor, they certainly push up, but they automatically are invasive right from the get-go. Um, even so, it's, though it's in, invasive right from the get-go, it's not as aggressive as a squamous cell skin cancer. And the reason for that is is that basal cell skin cancers, they, they need to sort of grow in a mucinous kind of snot-like stroma. So it can't be quite as, um, you know, it doesn't have quite the roots as you can see in the squamous cell and, and melanoma, which tend to have these roots and invasive quality. So uh, good for us um, as dermatologists that usually when we see it, it's usually sort of a small little pearly, almost like a pimple that's not going away, kind of shiny bump. Uh, earlier stages can look a little bit even more subtle, just like a little red, you know, flaky area. Um, but this is the most common stage at which we diagnose it kind of like a nodule, like a nodular basal cell. And then when we look at it through dermoscopy, we see very clear features. So it's actually almost instantaneous diagnosis. So fortunately, we can often diagnose it early, but sometimes when it's on locations like for example, the scalp or especially the vertex where, you know, as we age, our hair thins and may not be paying attention, it can turn into these ulcerated sort of nodules. Um, and so, you know, we'll kind of go through treatments for all sorts of stages. Um, so just as a quick um you know, staging, people always want to know, you know, what is my stage? In basal cells, we're never saying, oh, this is a death sentence. But when do you get kind of worried a little bit more about it? And the answer is that if you don't take away anything else from this slide, it's it's mostly the size. So if the tumor is less than two centimeters, generally speaking, it's usually well-defined and it's like the first time this tumor has come up on the skin, it's generally pretty low risk. And 
um, tends to be very easy to cut out and, and remove. Um, but for tumors that become bigger than two centimeters, and I would say bigger than a centimeter in special locations, like for example, near the eye or on the lip, uh, or on the ears or nose, then they tend to become a little bit more challenging, both from a surgical standpoint and also have a higher chance of coming back or become recurrent. And then when we look at it under the microscope, they can have a more aggressive histology, um, you know, all these sort of big words that our pathologists help us determine. So when they're more aggressive, sometimes we have to use other treatments besides surgery, like add some radiation or some other treatments. Um, some other things, um, so we have Fortunately, have some data on, you know, if they are bigger than two centimeters, um, what are sort of the risk of that tumor coming back after surgery, which is surgery, usually the first line treatment for basal cells, because we can just cut out that whole nodule and we're, you know, cure it. Um, and the, and the idea is that, you know, there's, there are basically two things that we worry about in basal cells. If they're bigger than two centimeters, one, is it going to come back after we cut it out? And the other is that, you know, is it going to cause, is it going to spread to, you know, local lymph nodes, um, and lead to any kind of death. So the spread and the death are sort of combined here. So death is very rare. Um, so mostly we're looking at the spread. And, you know, the head and neck location by far is just the most, uh, so the most dangerous to have a large tumor. And the reason is because lifelong we're getting sun exposure in this area. And basal cell is a disease of chronic sun exposure. So, you know, I kind of think about the amount of sun exposure everybody is allowed to have before they develop cancer is like a bucket that's given to you. And um, everyone's bucket is a little bit different. You know, the lighter or fair skinned you are, more family history of skin cancer, you have your bucket smaller, so it's going to start spilling sooner. So the folks that are fair skinned and have a family history tend to be a, need to be a little bit more careful about adding to that, uh, adding more sunlight and sun damage to that bucket uh, and vice versa. So head and neck, definitely a very challenging location. Uh, if it's a big tumor where it's invading, not just the first, the second, but into the third layer of the skin, which is fat, you know, chances of spread are definitely, uh, chances of recurrence are definitely higher three times. Um, and then if you treat it with Mohs, especially on the head and neck, tends to be that the recurrence is less. And that's why a lot of times when people say, well, I have a basal cell on my arm. Last time I had it on my nose, it had Mohs, but why are we not doing this on the arm? And that the reason is exactly this. When it's on the head and neck and we're treating, not treating it with Mohs reduces the risk of recurrence, basically. Um, so that's why we try to do Mohs, especially for tumors that are larger than two centimeters. Um, so in this study, Mohs showed recurrence. Um, risk decreased by 86%. So, and um, if anyone has had a skin cancer, hopefully they've come across some of these treatment options that were discussed, um, you know, so Mohs is one treatment, but if you have a small tumor or a tumor off the head and neck, we can do just a plain surgical excision in which we take a four millimeter margin. Um, you know, there's something called local destruction procedure called an EDNC, where we just sort of curette the tumor. Uh, we don't, don't do that generally on the head and neck, but we do that other parts of the body and the cure rates are somewhere in the 98%. So that's a really easy, good way to not have stitches um, and the infection risk is small. Uh, when it gets to be the two centimeter and deeper tumors where the recurrence risk starts to get high, then we start to think about radiation. And then there is this option to remain untreated. Um, and I will just mention that because, you know, as we age, our risk of skin cancer goes up. So we definitely see more skin cancer when people turn, you know, in their, in their 70s, in their 80s, in their 90s. And I personally uh, have had several patients in their 90s just choose to remain untreated because the chances, as I said, of this metastasizing are very low. And so if you're dealing with multiple health problems and it's a tumor that's just there, not bleeding and not causing trouble, perfectly good option to just watch it. We call it like sort of this, you know, uh, observation, active observation, and only remove it if it's becoming a nuisance. Um, so I will say that that's a very important option to consider, you know, if you have a loved one um, who has a basal cell, that's it, that's not causing them trouble and they're, you know, have other, other, other um, comorbidities. So I'm um, just going to Mo's. One thing I just wanted to mention, um, you know, since this is something that a lot of people go through, or at least have a loved one to go through, some of the tips and tricks, um, you know, that can help make this a little bit easier, um, you know, is just to read the instructions from the from the Mo's team when they're about to do that. And this also goes for surgical. Um, and generally speaking, you don't have to stop many medications, including blood thinners, because if you're on a blood thinner, it's usually for a good reason. 
Um, and we want to make sure that we don't cause a stroke or heart attack in the process of taking out a small, you know, tumor. Um, I do find that if it's not in the ear, if the tumor is not in the ear, bringing like some sort of music with you can be very soothing because there's a lot of, you know, noise and instruments clicking and that can cause a lot of anxiety, especially the first time. And, a, you know, on a location like the face, um, some of my patients also bring like essential oils with them and just sort of, you know, calms them. And especially if you're wearing the mask, um, you know, you can put a drop of it inside the mask. This also helps a lot when you're going through an EDNC procedure. The scrape and burn procedure can be very smelly because it smells like like burning chicken feathers is what people tell me. So it can be really um, traumatic to, to be thinking that's your own skin burning, you know, so having an essential oil can be really helpful. Um, and then most, uh, often the most surgeons are, you know, commonly prescribed anti-anxiety medication just for the duration of the procedure and that can kind of help with just calming down any nerves you may have. Um, preparing with wound care supplies. And so after the procedure, like for example, this gentleman, he has these stitches. I mean, it looks like it healed beautifully, um, but he's, you know, it was probably pretty swollen and painful because a nose is a very tight skin area. And after the surgery, the wound swells and the swelling is very painful in the skin. So having some sort of a pressure dressing supply kit can be really helpful if you have a loved one who's a medical professional, like a nurse or somebody, you know, just to kind of get their services, reserve them ahead of time and help them, you know, rebandage your wounds. Um, and then, you know, just know that the scars on the head and neck heal really well. A lot of people are really worried about what it's going to look like after they're done. But you can see it looks beautiful after just because of the great vascular supply we have in the head and neck. And then a lot of times post-surgical like scar creams can be helpful. But we generally just good old-fashioned massage and Vaseline and sunscreen do the trick. Um, but Mederma and some of the other ones are pretty good as well. So just getting back a little bit into sort of the data. So what if you have someone that has like a fairly advanced tumor and surgery and radiation are not an option? Turns out that 80 to 85 percent of our basal cells have a single, you know, have a particular type of mutation uh, in one pathway. So they're genetically somewhat similar. So the good thing is we can actually kind of hit uh, that mutation and stop these tumors from growing. And there's two medications that are FDA approved for this. Um, and they show that the sort of disease control rate on these medications is almost 90%. So 90% of the patients that are on these patients tend to become no worse. And a lot of them, you know, improve in somewhere in the, in the 60 to 70% of the tumors do shrink down. And then typically if the medicine works, it continues to work for several months up to two years, depending on which one we're talking about. But eventually, unfortunately, there is some resistance if the tumor is not cured at that point. So therefore, these medications are not considered upfront. So a lot of times people will come and say, well, you know, I've had so many basal cells removed. Why can't we just do a pill? We can. It's just that your cure rate's not quite as high. But there is a room for that because a lot of times we have people come in and they have just, you know, 30 basal cells. And it's just, it's just impossible to start cutting every single one without causing very, very, very significant morbidity. So we do sometimes use these oral medications for that. There are some side effects with them uh, that are listed here, the most common ones being sort of the muscle cramps that bother people especially when you're living in the sun belt with a lot of heat, hair loss and taste disturbance also, you know, affecting some quality of life. But for the right person, this could be a game changer. These medications can really reduce the morbidity. Um, and most of the side effects do tend to be reversible, those medications, except for, I think, the hair loss, depending on how long you've been on the medication. And then coming back to the immunotherapy, which has become the catch-all for a lot of cancers, um, Liptea or Simiplimab that you just heard about from Dr. Musafar in squamous cell is also approved for basal cell treatment, both for a locally recurrent or a locally large tumor on the skin or, and also for metastatic basal cell. Um, and this was a phase two study with patients who had, you know, who had large tumors, aggressive tumors, uh, or metastatic tumors. Um, and then there's a condition called Gorlin syndrome where patients get hundreds and thousands of basal cells cells in their lifetime because of a genetic mutation. Unfortunately, in that population, this medication did not work quite as well. So if there's anyone here listening, um, you know, Gorlin syndrome certainly would be try it, yes, but the response rates are tend to be lower. And we think it's because for Gorlin syndrome, the basal cells are not actually as mutated because they already have the one mutation, um, you know, at birth. And so most of their tumors are not quite as aggressive. Um, but it's given the same way, you know, 350 milligrams, um, which is the, the same dose as the squamous cell every three weeks. Um, and in this trial, you know, basal cells were evaluated both with measurements of the scans and the photographs, uh, you know, for each nine week cycle. 
Um, and in this patient, again, you know, with, with any trial of basal cell, you're going to see an older population, although the youngest patient was 38 years old. And I would probably bet that patient had Gorlin syndrome, um, you know, for to get an aggressive tumor at that age. So mostly, you know, you tend to see these to be, be more aggressive as people get older and also more common in men. Um, I blame golf uh, for that. Um, I'm just kidding. But but yes, tend to be men. Not sure why, but I think probably just because of the jobs and like the, the recreational activities. But we do think it's a majority sun related tumor, mostly Caucasians, um, and and hundred percent of the patients have previously taken a hedgehog inhibitor. So semiplumab, you know, as opposed to in squamous cell where it's like for aggressive tumor, it's first line. We generally first still treat people with the oral medications that we were talking about, the Aravigin or Damsa, before we go go on to Libteo. Um, and I'll talk about why in just a second. Um, but again, head and neck tumors being most most common uh, commonly treated in this study. Um, and so, what was the the so what what happened basically? So we started to talk about you know what are the outcomes of the study. So there's a lot of people that dis discontinued the study, and most most common reason was um, progression of disease. Um, and the progression of disease occurred in like one third of patients that had the, the aggressive tumors, but not metastatic. So the metastatic people, you know, tend to progress a little bit more. So the response rates in the study tended to be a little bit lower and the and disease progressed a little bit, but in, but you have to kind of remember too, these are more aggressive tumors that have failed surgery, failed radiation, and also possibly failed oral medication. So these are the worst actors, um, you know, in uh, that were, that were on the study and usually treated with Libteo. So, Something to think about, you know, uh, when you're thinking about immunotherapy it tends to work a little bit better in squamous cell than it tends to work in basal cell. The other reason not to start with Libteo, at least in basal cell, like right off the bat, is just the side effects. So most of the common side effects are pretty easy to manage, uh, although maybe not quite as easy for somebody to endure uh, and good for people to know if, if you have a loved one going through this. But um, one in three patients tended to get a serious reaction. So when you're dealing with a basal cell that may not be quite as serious and you're dealing with serious reactions like, you know, bad diarrhea, colitis, things like that, um, like bloody diarrhea, you, you, you know, kind of have to think about what are the pros and cons uh, of this medication. Fetal adverse reactions, which is where people died uh, while on Lipteo, not always of Lipteo, but, you know, we're getting this medication is 1.5%. Now, that fatality is basically zero with every other treatment that we've discussed so far. And so that's another reason why we don't typically start with immunotherapy, although generally it is very well tolerated, you know, and the and the and the death from Libteo is far is much, much lower because we recognize the side effects much earlier and treat them much earlier. Um, but it is something to think about when we're dealing with it in terms of basal cell skin cancer. So it works clearly in the, the large tumors that had a metastasize, um, you know, about response rate somewhere in the 30%, one in three is sort of what I take away from this study, but the people that had metastatic basal cells, it was about one in five patients had some skin shrinkage in their tumors. And again, this is these are aggressive tumors that have already been through all the other treatments. So we are grateful to have this, uh, you know, treatment for our patients. But just know that as we go past, as the disease continues to come back, it becomes harder and harder to treat. So in conclusion, um, you know, if you did respond to Libteo, let's say you were on those lucky people, one third that got better, what happens? Um, you know, how does how do people feel about it? Most people said that they maintained or improved their symptoms, functioning, quality of life. So if if unfortunately I cannot show you pictures from this trial, but if I could, you would see these large ulcerating tumors sort of shrink down to the point where at least they were not bleeding and painful. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, it is, even though the on the surface looks like a lot of side effects in the right patient, that could be the right, uh, right option. Um, and and we have, you know, amazing medical oncologists, you know, who can make that uh, help you make that decision. So as far as like the aggressive basal cells, I've just listed some pros and cons, um, you know, of all the three drugs that we have that shrink these. I think the bottom line is to know that even if you have an aggressive tumor, most of the tumors we treat very easily, but if you have an aggressive tumor, we've got some really good options where we can balance some pros and cons. And with that, um, I really thank you for your attention um, and wear your sunscreen. <laughs>